Our next presentation will be a lecture by Simon O'Rourke. Simon began reading Theosophical books in 1992 and joined the Society soon afterwards in 1993. He has been treasurer, president, and lodge manager of Blavatsky Lodge in Sydney, Australia. He was recently appointed as Education Coordinator of the Theosophical Society in Australia. We shall now have Simon in this presentation which asks whether it's possible to have love and unity in time of individualism. Hello. In The Secret Doctrine, H.P. Blavatsky taught that there are three simultaneous developments within the human being the spiritual, mental, and physical, involving the perfection of the seven principles, and that the slowest of all to develop is the mental evolution. She informs us that in order for mind to develop, the spiritual life, which would make mental reasoning unnecessary, was gradually veiled in the slow process of evolution. We are now in an upward arc of the fourth of seven rounds, covering the life of this planet in the fifth of seven sub-cycles, gradually learning about our psychological nature, Kama Manus, or desire mind. And in the process, we are learning to think individually. But can a mind living in the now maintain both a sense of individuality and a sense of love, compassion, kindness, and unity? It is impossible to pass by the mind, which is the link between the spiritual and the material. In the secret doctrine, of course, Fohat is the mysterious link between mind and matter. This was symbolized in the mythological story of Odysseus, or Ulysses in Latin, whose Greek name means one who is hated and implies trouble an individuality who lives with constant suffering and separation, and the loss of harmony and happiness as he seeks his way home after the great war in Troy. Odysseus had fought as a warrior on the outward journey in Troy, the material nature which had beguiled and imprisoned the mind, symbolized by Helen of Argos, who became Helen of Troy until freed and brought back to her senses. One may think of Prevriti here, yet Odysseus is also famous for his cunning and thoughtfulness and is a favorite of the goddess Athena. Following the fall of Troy after 10 long years, Odysseus sets off with the spoils of conquest on his return home with the same, spiting, sorry, with the same fighting spirit that had served him so well in former battles. We may see this part as an inward journey and spiritual return. And one may think of Nivriti here. However, the journey home has seen many costly battles, people, friends and crew, ships and treasures diminished and lost. He must now learn to subdue his warring spirit and fight instead with the spirit of love. At a certain point in this journey, midway home, he meets with Cirque, whose spells and illusions had turned the crew of his ship into animals. Hermes, the god, advises Odysseus how to defeat Cirque, and he overcomes her spells, protected by the aid of a divine herb. The allegory teaches that we too can allow our powers to be squandered by the animal nature until restored by wisdom. His sensual animal nature conquered, Cirque is compelled to tell him how to find his way home. There are two paths from which he may continue. The first is the clashing rocks in the narrow channel through which Jason and his ship Diago had traveled with the assistance of the goddess Hera. The second is the narrow channel between the monsters Scylla and Charybdis. In the first channel, with the clashing rocks, the ship symbolizes the consciousness of one trying to pass through in meditation to a higher state. The clashing rocks are symbolically 
our own many uncontrolled thoughts, which rend that unconscious, sorry, which rend that consciousness to pieces and which is impossible, sorry, impossible to pass through until one is ready to be drawn by devotion to the beloved within. The goddess Hera, who inspired love in Zeus, she also representing the element of air, according to Plato's Cratylus, the cosmic elements between fire and water associated with mind. In the second path, one may travel with the guidance of the higher knowledge of the subtle forces of nature. Odysseus, on the advice of Cirque, chooses the second passing between Scylla and Charybdis. Scylla is a form of multi-headed serpent and Charybdis a monster chained to the seabed whose unquenchable thirst causes whirlpools as she draws in the dark waters to satisfy her thirst three times a day, sucking unwary ships down to the bottom of the sea and to their doom. He is advised by Cirque not to fight directly against Scylla or desire, which she represents, as she is too powerful and she would waste his energy in a battle he could never hope to win. He passes by in his ship, remembering her words, learning the lesson that one should not fight for the sake of pride or habit, keeping his attention forward, resisting the impulse to pit his mortal frame against eternal matter. The ship slides through the channel, but still six lives are lost to the Hydra's six heads, full of sharp rows of teeth. Perhaps one may say six past incarnations, therefore the cost is high. In the narrow strait, he cannot help passing too close to Charybdis, which represents thirst or Trishna, the thirst for material life. Her insatiable thirst draws her draws towards her an irresistible and forceful whirlpool whose downward course destroys his ship, drowning his remaining crew. When all is nearly lost, he reaches at the last moment above his head, allegorically above and beyond the mind, and clings tenaciously to a small fig tree which hangs down from the surrounding cliffs. This fig, is symbolically related to other sacred fig trees, such as the Bodhi tree. And its presence in this allegory symbolizes the last hope of wisdom between a mortal life and destruction. After further trials, Odysseus later succeeds in returning home to his beloved wife, Penelope. Together, after 20 years of longing and devotion, they unite in their wedding chambers in which one leg of their bed is a living olive tree, another sacred tree related to the fig. Their union represents the union of Atma Buddhi. We may remember that each one of us is Odysseus, leading lives of trouble and suffering, trying to find our way home. And in the part just related, through one of two paths, either through higher and inexpressible longing to pass through the clashing thoughts or through knowledge of our own nature and the forces of the lower and higher psyche. In theosophical terms, understanding the mortal nature of Kama Manas, desire mind, and the immortal nature of Buddhi Manas, being wisdom mind. We may see the two paths or approaches again in the Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path, given in the discourse on setting the wheel of Dhamma in motion. One may progress gradually through developing to a high degree each noble step in turn, one by one, right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, and right kind of work, right energy, right mindfulness or memory, and right meditation. Or alternatively, one may focus the attention on the last of these, 
right meditation, devoted to the abstract, fixing the mind on the highest. With the mind dedicated to right meditation, it has been said one may gradually master all of the other noble qualifications. Right understanding and so on. In the little book at the feet of the master, the last step, which is usually translated as liberation from the cycle of births and deaths, is said to be more accurately translated as love, meaning, as it says, that pure love, which allows one to acquire all of the other qualities in order to help uplift humanity. In ancient times, the four chief virtues were fortitude or strength, temperance, prudence, and justice. Justice is the all-encompassing virtue, and according to Polis, following the teaching of Pythagoras, was the mother and nurse of the other virtues. Justice concerns all of our relationships, whether it is harmony in the country in which we live, harmony in the family, and harmony within ourselves. Therefore, the virtue of justice cannot exist without the other virtues. Or to put it another way, by developing the virtue of justice, one cannot help but to develop the other virtues or character strengths of fortitude, temperance, and prudence. Some people think of temperance as the abstention of alcohol and drugs, but it means more than this. It is self-control and has much in common with right energy or exertion. Likewise, prudence is more than a cunning and cautious mind. It is well-considered thought and memory and the constant practice of prudence is really the same as the practice of mindfulness. Meditation is a form of interrelationship, rediscovering the whole behind the veil of the fragment. Justice is also a form of interrelationship, seeing all of the fragments as the whole, unity. Therefore, we could also say when, sorry, therefore we could also say one cannot have justice without love, nor love without justice. I know there may be appearances to the contrary, but it is worth thinking about. Mindfulness is not quite the same as right mindfulness. Similarly, living in the now, the present, is not quite the same as, strange to say, right living in the now. As we learn in theosophical teachings, every thought is built on the combination and recombination of elements from past images, including sound, etc. And each new form is permeated with the character of our motives and intentions, good, bad, or selfless. But how does the now relate to the eternal now? The eternal now also concerns eternal interrelationships. In her book, A Study in Karma, Annie Besson states that this universal law of causation binds together into one all that happens within a manifestation, for it is universal interrelation, interrelation between all that exists, that is karma. She goes on to say, it is therefore coexistent, simultaneous with the coming into existence of any special universe. Therefore, karma is eternal as the universal self. The interrelation of everything always is. It never begins, it never ceases to be. The unreal has no being, the real never ceases to be. Nothing exists isolated 
alone, out of relation, and karma is the interrelation of all that exists. It is manifest during the manifestation of the universe as regards that universe. It becomes latent in its dissolution. She goes on to say, in the all, everything is always, all that has been, all that now is manifest, all that will be, all that can be, all possibilities, as well as all actualities, are ever in being in the all. That which is outwards, the forthgoing, existence, the unfolded, is the manifested universe. That which is, as really, although inwards, the infolded, is the unmanifested universe. But the within, the unmanifested, is as real as the without, the manifested. The interrelation between beings, in or out of manifestation, is the eternal karma. As being never ceases, so karma never ceases, but always is. When part of that, which, will sim which is simultaneous in the all, becomes manifested as a universe, the eternal interrelation becomes successive and is seen as cause and effect. In the one being, the all, everything is linked to everything else. Everything is related to everything else. And in the phenomenal, the manifested universe, these links and relations are drawn out into successive happenings, causally connected in the order of their succession in time, that is, in appearance. She further says, the interrelations which exist in the thought of the eternal become the interrelations between phenomena in the manifested universe. The portion of the thought put forth as a universe. Before the manifestation of any special universe, there will be in the eternal the thought of the universe which is to be and its interrelations that which exists simultaneously out of time and space in the eternal now, gradually appears in time and space as successive phenomena. Understanding and working out our many and complex interrelationships is an important part of life. Hence, one reason that development of the mind is slower than the development of the spiritual and physical nature. Although we speak of justice as balancing these interrelationships, it may equally be thought of as love. It is from love that we may learn to bring unity in the outer life. And it is from love that karmic justice brings harmony to the inner life. Justice or harmony in interrelationships is the same as perfected love in interrelationships, in which mutual concern creates the same balance and harmony. Justice, love, and even the associations of thought in the mind are very closely connected. When the human immortal soul or psyche achieves individuality, from the animal kingdom, the causal vehicle representing one soul to one incarnation is established. The firstborn, as has been said, it has been mentioned that animals may become individualized as human beings, either through the development of the intellect, even if that arises through the avoidance of cruelty, or the power of devotion and love to their human companions. Again, there appears in that the same idea of dual paths, a lower reflection of the mystical or path of devotion and the path of occult knowledge. 
However, the individual soul or being has yet to fully develop the individual mind. In life, we move along three broad stages, like the child who follows its parents, learning about itself and others, later growing into an adult, ready to have a family or devote itself to other responsibilities, and the last stage in which that person then retires from the world, perhaps giving dedicated attention to the spiritual life and consolidating a lifetime of experiences. Looking at the law of correspondences, we follow the same pattern through many incarnations. And again, as collective humanity, in the first stage, we learn with guidance, we observe and imitate. Then in the next stage, we participate. And in the last, we synthesize the sum of experiences either for ourselves or others. Although they are sequential, following the law of causation, karma, yet these three stages remind us of the three simultaneous evolutions mentioned by HPV earlier, the spiritual, the mental, and the physical. When we participate and take responsibility, carry out our own dharma or mission, then there is a sense of individuality. If we fulfill that dharma cooperatively and to the best of our abilities, then there is a sense of unity by upholding the whole. That is a difficult thing to do, to fulfill our individual potential. Yet, to realize that the part is an illusion when seen against the whole. And difficult to practice is full and conscious cooperation, bringing to bear our whole nature. A child may cooperate because it does not have the power of the fruits of its growth. And that is not the cooperation of, de of a developed human being. And it can be difficult to cultivate that tolerance which comes from patience, love and kindness, true strength, true fortitude, a philosophical tolerance in which we know the success and failure of our own duties and responsibilities and the success and failures of others will lead to greater opportunities for growth in this and future lives. For every failure in which we miss the mark, there is an opportunity for someone else to help. How do we cooperate consciously? In a small book published after her death called The Original Program of the Theosophical Society, HPB writes that she and Alcott were only given a brief set of instructions by the inner founders, the masters of the wisdom, as to what the Theosophical Society should and should not be. They were occasionally given support and advice, but were mostly left free and unimpeded to throw themselves into the work. This kind of higher trust is rare, and it is not easy to be fully cooperative where there are karmic limitations and restrictions holding us down. Perhaps the karmic lesson in this case is to realize that we may have held others back in a past life, or even ourselves, even with the best of intentions. And it may be better simply to endure until those limitations pass and we earn the right to be trusted by one who has progressed beyond the human kingdom, such as a master of the wisdom, who can genuinely see with a more complete perspective. The ultimate purpose of our human individuality is beautifully expressed in the light on the path as we seek out the way, as we try and find our way home. 
Each man is to himself absolutely the way, the truth, and the life, it says. But he is only so when he grasps his whole individuality firmly, and by the force of his awakened spiritual will, recognizes this individuality as not himself, but that thing which he has with pain created for his own use, and by means of which he purposes, as his growth slowly develops his intelligence, to reach to the life beyond individuality. When he knows that for this, his wonderful, complex, separated life exists, then indeed, and then only, he is upon the way. This individuality is described in this passage as not himself, but that thing which he has with pain created for his own use. This points to the idea that pain, the very thing we run and hide from and resent perhaps for years, which brings consolidation to our individuality, deserves our acceptance and attention rather than our fear. By fear, I mean that controlling fear which can make us less than noble. He continues in Light on the Path and says, seek it by seeking, sorry, seek it by plunging into the mysterious and glorious depths of your own inmost being. Seek it by testing all experience, by utilizing the senses, that is not yield to the seduction of the senses, but use them in order to explore, by utilizing the senses in order to understand the growth and meaning of individuality and the beauty and obscurity of those other divine fragments which are struggling side by side with you and form the race to which you belong. Seek it by study of the laws of being, the laws of nature, the laws of the supernatural, and seek it by making the profound obeisance of the soul to the dim star that burns within. Steady as you watch and worship, its light will grow stronger. Then you may know you have found the beginning of the way, and when you have found the end, its light will suddenly become the infinite light. It was said the founding of the Theosophical Society marked an impulse that stimulated the democratization of the occult, opening a bridge from east to west and a greater awareness of evolution. The next impulse in the last quarter of the last century was meant to stimulate widespread esotericism, a new age, and an awareness of the concept of spiritual and not just material evolution. We live in a time where individuality is being awakened in the wider community and technology has progressed with it, moving in the last few thousand years from parchment to, to the printing press and recently to electronic networks, communications and the internet. In conventional society, we are not always happy with the results. Sometimes we wish people would express their feelings and thoughts and ideas, and at other times where there is hatred and divisiveness, we wish they didn't. Centuries ago, people would argue through the printed pages of pamphlets and posted journals, such as those distributed throughout Europe. Thomas More once commented, soon after the invention of the printing press, that the constant accusations of heresy in these pamphlets was not unlike a group of naked people in a field of stones. Everyone has abundant weapons, but no one has any defense. In some ways, very little has changed. New technologies have recently opened up many opportunities that were once available only to wealthy individuals and organizations. There have been 
for much of the Theosophical Society's history, independent publications. But these were usually costly to, pr to print and distribute. Recent technologies have made this process relatively inexpensive. This has brought new ways of promulgating theosophy to people throughout the world. Anyone can now publish a digital book, an online magazine, make a video for streaming, stream live radio and podcasts. We can watch presentations in video meetings and collaborate in groups. Yet this is not really new. Even from the earliest days of the Theosophical Society, people would acquire skills in their work life in the outer world as accountants, managers, printers, teachers, artists and writers and so on, and put these skills to good use in supporting their local lodge activities and committees. In the same way, the abilities and skills people have attained in their use of these newer digital publishing and streaming media technologies may enhance the present work of the Theosophical Society, being very useful in presenting theosophical concepts to the world, especially brotherhood in its full spiritual meaning involving love and unity. The Theosophical Society's first object is to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color. This nucleus is itself a center, perhaps one among many. It represents the collective members as an individuality. Just as we need a strong individuality to face the trials of the spiritual path, as with Odysseus, on his journey mentioned earlier, so too do we need a strong nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity to do the work of this society. The same idea which applies to a human being may equally apply to a spiritual organization, which, as light on the path gave it above, if I may paraphrase for this instance, the force of our collective awakened spiritual will recognizes this individuality as not our collective selves, but that thing which we have with pain created for our own use, and by means of which we purpose, as our growth slowly develops our collective intelligence, to reach to the life beyond the organization's individuality. Do we need theosophical societies when we have a theosophical movement and sophisticated technologies that help us to meet across the world as we once did across the neighborhood? If people work outside this nucleus, to some extent, they may work too long alone and perhaps without the benefit and support of others that are otherwise within that nucleus. For that nucleus is our most precious possession, one hardly and by long continued effort by both our fellow members since its founding and by those kindred lives we work with now. The work that we do is less important than the way we do that work and those with whom we work. The strength of our relationships have been developed over many lifetimes, developing affinity and consideration, and they will be there to help us in future lifetimes to come, and we them. If I may quote from the Jubilee Convention, those who so desire may seek alone, may tread alone their pathway, though we know that there will come a time when they will have had enough of loneliness. The strength of all movements 
that support abstract and practical brotherhood depends on the strength of the theosophical movement. And the strength of the theosophical movement depends on the strength of the theosophical society. But it is equally important to ask, as I have often asked myself, are we welcoming to people their talents and interests within the TS? Do we make the same room for others that we would like for ourselves? Giving everyone a place to grow and develop. The interrelationships in the eternal now and the present now, as mentioned earlier, are only different in their manifestation through sequential causality. There seems to be a complementary interrelationship when we try to realize our unity with humanity without, and in meditation to realize our unity with the one life within. It seems impossible to work with one without touching the other. The more we love everything in life and see that every interrelationship is in a constant movement to be resolved, the more we feel that sense of unity and the more we feel we would put our individuality in its service. We raise humanity a little towards the spiritual when we endeavor to raise ourselves and we raise ourselves a little when we endeavor to raise humanity through the Theosophical Society. Though difficult in practice, a nucleus of universal brotherhood without distinctions is an object worth achieving to help us all to reach beyond individuality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, for that profound presentation on love and unity in the time of individuality. Now, we have a few questions for you. The first question is whether individuality is the same as the ego. So the question is, is individuality the same as the ego? I always think of uh, something that CWL wrote in a, quite a few of his works where he spoke about the idea of forgetting the self. And this seems to be such an important idea that uh, we focus so much of our lives on building up our own individuality in this particular life so focused on being the center everywhere we walk and with every relationship with which we engage, I found it quite refreshing, that simple little phrase, forget the self. But then it kind of opens up the door to, well, if we forget the self, what do we think of or focus on instead? And of course, that is our dharma. Our mission in life is to understand what to focus on instead of the self, or rather to use the self, to be like the dancer who at first learns the steps, gradually understands the choreography, learns the movements, is completely focused on forming uh, the movements, the patterns and so on, until eventually they stop thinking about the dance and just focus on relating in the performance. And there's a similar thing in ritual as well, where a person learns off some words to engage in some ritual until they reach a point where they're no longer thinking of learning or memorizing the words, they're actually expressing the words, they're expressing the dance. And in the same way, if we can concentrate and focus on our Dharma, our mission in life, the work that we're meant to do, then we can forget the self. And of course, there are these interrelationships, these karmic links formed over many lifetimes. And these karmic links, these relationships 
help us to actually focus on what is important, which are our relationships. When we die, we don't take our work with us. What we take with us is how well we did the work and all of the interrelationships that we've had during our life. So therefore, if our dharma and our karma, the relationships that we've come to explore and work out, are all interconnected with an organization like the Theosophical Society, or perhaps even some other organizations, workplaces and so on, then that is where we have to find the solution to the problem of life, which is, of course, ourselves. So in this, we tend to focus on what uh, is often referred to in, uh, or used to be referred to in psychology as the ego, the sense of I-ness. And of course, we know the idea of egoism implies in a, in a negative context that there is something negative about that ionist, that it is fundamentally a selfish, uh, self-focused condition. And my understanding, since these words can mean many different things, but my understanding is that this sense of ahamkara, this sense of i -ness is a little bit different to the individuality. Annie Besant once said that, and I can't recall exactly where, but one said that, that individuality has a correlation to consciousness, that that which is indivisible can't be broken up. So where there is consciousness that can't be broken up, there is the individual. HPB similarly said that although there is the one life, the one, she said there are two ones. There's the one in manifestation and the one out of manifestation. And even that one in manifestation is in a sense, an individuality, though it is not, the, it is not necessarily uh, separate to that which lies behind it or within it um, or beyond it in some way. So individuality is consciousness and that consciousness can manifest through the sense of I-ness, the sense of ego. In a sense, the, uh, the older psychology would refer to our human ego as being what in theosophical terms we would refer to as kama manas, desire mind. But in theosophy, we often refer to the higher ego, the higher sense of I-ness, which is focused through the upper part of the mind, the higher mind or the mind of atma, uh, uh, sorry, buddhi manas, wisdom mind. So in a sense, the difference between theosophy and uh, what is popularly known as ego for most people is really the nature of whether it is our immortal ego, our immortal buddhi manas, or our personal ego, our personal kama manas, K-A-M-A, -A, desire, desire mind. So this is only one small part of the individuality. If we think of the self, uh, the higher self, if you like, atma, that part of our universal nature that unites with nirvana, which is beyond the personal, which is beyond um, the limitations that lie below it. So if we look at those particular things, then we can see that there is a correspondence between the higher uh, unity, which HPB referred to, the higher one, which is the unmanifest, and the lower one, the manifest one, with the idea of atma and the manifestation of the self through all of its vehicles of consciousness, all representing, if you like, individuality, which belongs to that higher self, that part of our nature that is united with Nirvana. Now this, it's interesting to look at this individuality in a life because we do see that although we are individual, it does go through in line with theosophical teachings, seven fundamental changes during life. We can see that this 
individuality, which we sometimes focus so much only in ourselves, um, instead of using it for the, the true self within, for the purpose of uh, altruism, for the purpose of helping the whole and upholding the whole. Uh, this self uh, works through, this individuality works through seven stages. And we can think of it in the early part of life as a young baby that we're largely unconscious of the individual self. We simply react to circumstances around us. And very slowly and very gradually, we start to become aware of the other and start to focus our senses on awareness of the other. And this becomes the next stage, which is consciousness of the others, but is not necessarily fully determining as an individuality. And of course, the third stage is where having or growing up, we do start to become self-determining as an individuality and much more self-conscious rather than necessarily conscious of just the other or being dictated to by the other. Then, of course, we reach the midpoint where we perhaps equivalent to the midlife crisis and, and so on, where we start to question our individuality and the purpose of our individuality. We question the goals that we set as a self-determining individual. And then we start to actually go beyond that and either we stay on the path that we're on or perhaps we start to find a new path. And uh, it's it was interesting that there were people such as Annie Besant and Colonel Alcott in the early days who actually also went through a similar, similar process in their early 40s, around 42, where they started to actually come into contact with uh, theosophical ideas and their direction changed, their individuality changed. And so this brings us to the next stage where we start to achieve different kinds of goals or perhaps goals on the same path, but we're now no longer setting the goals, we're actually starting to uh, realize and achieve them for ourselves. And then as we start to get older, we start to again, a little bit reflecting the earlier stage, we focus less on ourselves and more on the other. And it's not unusual for people late in life to join nonprofit organizations, to start doing charity work and so on, because they're focused more on the other, looking after grandchildren. All of these things are a part of the process where they start to step back a little bit from their own individuality and yet still utilizing that for the benefits and help of others. And of course, we reach the, uh, the last stage uh, similar to the seven stages of man as spoken by, uh, written by William Shakespeare, but the last stage of um, sans, sans hair, sans teeth, sans everything. And we start to withdraw from the sense of the individual and become focused on what lies beyond, where we're no longer able even to work on committees, perhaps even to give talks and lectures to help in uh, the Theosophical Order of Service or charity work, and we're largely in a withdrawal process, moving away from the physical individuality. So we see that we go through these different stages, and as a life or a, an ego, an inus that comes into incarnation, we also go through similar stages, and as a person grows and develops, they start to focus on the other to such a strong ex extent that that becomes part of their dharma, their mission in life after life. And it's important to understand what our own mission is and to just try and fulfill those conditions, even though it is not particularly easy. It can be extremely difficult. It can be so hard working with other people. It can be so hard trying to share the things that have inspired us. Uh, all of these things create difficulties and we can't escape them any more than we can escape ourselves. We can only endure and persevere and work through those particular limitations. Now, it's in the nature of forget the self and think of Dharma, it reminds me of the saying from the Bhagavad Gita, which is better one's own duty 
or dharma, if you like, responsibility, better one's own responsibilities, though destitute of merit, than the duties or responsibilities of another well discharged. And I think that is an important point. We have to understand what we're meant to do in life and persevere and endure. And through that, we'll actually gain the experiences that will help us in a later life. And so it all it tends to have a purpose. And uh, in the nature of, of morals and ethics, the virtues and so on, all of this is not meant to be used purely for itself. The purpose of developing virtues is not necessarily just to show how strong and well developed we are, the character formations, but it's so that we can truly understand the real nature of what is right and what is wrong, what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing and so on. Uh, the nature of energy and abstinence and all of these things that are sometimes spoken of in the Bhagavad Gita. So in a sense, we could say, coming back to the question that individuality is consciousness and the ego is only one small part of that consciousness and that if we can understand the nature of the individuality we can understand the nature of the ego and if we understand the nature of the ego we can begin to understand the psychological uh, the wisdom aspects of our nature thank you for that clarifying answer on individuality and the ego now the next question is why is the individuality created with pain So the question is, why is the individuality created with pain? Well, if we understand, based on what we we're just speaking about, that individuality is uh, very much related to the idea of consciousness, that it is an indivisible, unbroken consciousness, then we have to look at the nature of manifestation of the one life itself as we pass down through the uh as the self if you like or that part of our nature that is united with nirvana if that part of our nature the pilgrim gradually comes into incarnation into denser and more material matter as we learn in the theosophical teachings then we begin to understand that the nature of the individual and the expansion of consciousness is that it has to pass through these denser formations, become one with all that is material in order to first understand it and then in order to be able to control it and especially to control oneself. So this means that even from the beginning in coming to as that the spiritual dimension within ourselves comes into materiality through the three elemental kingdoms, through the mineral kingdom, the uh, plant, the animal, and into the human kingdom. Each step of that growth means struggle against material conditions. And we can see that each step of that growth enables the building up of the form side of life, the vehicles, if you like. I always thought it was interesting that Annie Besant once made the comment that through pain and suffering or out of pain and suffering comes order. And I thought, well, that was an interesting thing for someone to say. And when you think about it, it is order in the sense of providing the vehicle for consciousness and providing the vehicle for the expression of the individual. And this is why uh pain in a way uh why individuality is created with pain because this is the part of individuality that is consciousness that works through the vehicles of that consciousness and as it works especially in the human kingdom through that vehicle of consciousness then that order brings strength to the individual so that that inner consciousness can better express itself. So instead of simply having dreams of helping other people, we can actually start to put that into practice 
and actually achieve the helping of other people. And of course, we're all part of the one life. And that means also learning how to accept help and guidance and support from others as well. Um, it's no good if we simply want to give and help, if we want to feel that that somehow makes us special or important. Every time we give and help, we also have to be willing to receive help. And that might be in a subtle way, such as a teaching that we read in a book where we're getting help from the author. Um, so we're still getting help, even though we may not necessarily think of it quite that way uh, while we're studying. Uh, so out of pain and suffering comes order through love, through empathy and through sympathy and so on. Of course, these are part of our spiritual nature derived from consciousness. And this certainly is a wonderful thing. It brings joy, it brings happiness, all the things that, that uh, make us feel more expansive, that makes us more, feel more in touch with unity and the one life. Pain tends to make us more conscious of our individual selves and tends to diminish the idea of expansiveness. And uh, so this is why that also leads to pain and suffering. But out of that, it does create the strengths for those vehicles of consciousness to better express the inner spiritual nature. So from this point of view, then talking about what we spoke about earlier, which is to forget the self, um, even though I'm talking a lot about the individuality, strangely enough, it's really important to forget the self and simply focus on the work that we have to do, our responsibilities, our dharma, and to learn to discriminate about whether, as that said in At the Feet of the Master and other works, simply to focus on what is our work and what is the work of others. Um, and that also means sometimes benefiting from the work of others. If we buy food from the supermarket, we're actually benefiting from the work and help of the farmers that put, put food into those supermarkets. So there's an interrelation going on there as well. All of this is so important to help us to grow. So love will help to draw out that spiritual part of our nature in the work that we do, but it's the pain and suffering that not only makes us strong, but also gives us the power, the ability to provide service. So in this sense, uh, pain leads to order, which leads to love, because out of pain, we also learn empathy and sympathy. Um, we know what it's like for others to suffer in a similar way. And out of that, which that leads also to service as well. So pain and suffering is part of the nature of the, of the individuality. And yet we don't have to necessarily become just focused on that individuality. Even when we're suffering, we can still focus on the whole, on unity. And sometimes that's extremely difficult. I mean, if we're in the middle of emotional pain, mental pain, physical pain, it's hard to take our mind away from our individual selves. But if we can focus on our Dharma, focus on what we're meant to be doing as much as possible, this helps to bring our minds back to the universal. Now, our final question here is, which spiritual powers can help to overcome challenges of the inner life? Uh, so the question is, which spiritual powers can help to overcome challenges of the inner life? Well, I think if you look at any of the great spiritual traditions, the great philosophies and philosophers, we often come up with the same fundamental ideas. And we can talk about it as, say, the Noble Eightfold Path, of developing those qualities relating to right understanding, right thought, right speech, and so on. We can look at it as the, as the chief virtues, the idea of fortitude, strength, so to speak, um, temperance, prudence, justice. These, for example, are the, 
the real inner strengths that we need to develop to then open up other and greater opportunities and other and greater powers as well. But certainly there is no greater power than to be able to and express a virtue in the right way at the right time. And if we look at the theosophical teachings, particularly related to the idea of this, the correspondences with the number seven, how that relates to so many aspects of life, then whether we look at the, the teaching related to the seven rays or the correspondences to the human being, the constitution of the human being, we can see that that these same four virtues mentioned earlier are also expressed as a sevenfold division as well. And we can see that strength, whether it's patience, for example, the strength of adhering to duty is very important. The strength of patience, the strength of having an individuality that's firm enough to be focused on the universal and not to be drawn in different directions by the life around us. And the courage, to, in order to have the courage of one's convictions as well. I do remember that, um, that Annie Besant in one of her writings uh, relating to her Indian work, related to the idea that she was instructed to be firm, but not provocative. And yet at the same time, there are, um, theosophists who have been or seen to be perceived to be I should say provocative as well so Annie Besant whether she wanted to or not was sometimes seen as being provocative uh, Krishnamurti was often seen as being provocative in his teachings uh, because not everybody necessarily understands them in the way that he expressed them uh, H.P. Blavatsky was sometimes seen as being provocative, especially by people in different religious traditions and the scientific community and so on. So it's important to have one's will develop so that even though there may be accusations of relating to being provocative, that we still maintain the important principles that we would wish to adhere to, to be strong, to be courageous and to be enduring these are so important and of course so strength is really important and of course wisdom in order to have the stillness to focus on the intuition the inner teaching the inner guidance within our own nature the universal um, anchor if you like within ourselves that universal light to be able to focus on our own spirituality, our, our own principles, and to have that as a guiding light in everything we do through all of our experiences. Of course, meditation is a fairly obvious uh, experience related to that, but that stillness, the quality of stillness that we can cultivate to actually allow that reflection of inner wisdom, that is a spiritual power. And then of course, the next one that we could develop would be to be able to actually uh, say the right thing to help a person to give them exactly what they need. And this is not an easy thing to do. In a sense, we could say that this is the basis for psychology, learning how to understand the inner nature of others and how to say the right thing to be able to help them in their understanding and their journey. And no matter how hard we try, the more we try to understand others, the more we try to tune into their needs, of course, we're going to make many, many mistakes. And yet it's inevitable. It's impossible to understand others without making mistakes. We can't necessarily go from complete ignorance of the condition of others to complete understanding unless we actually explore all the different possibilities. And at the same time, tune into ourselves as well as the other person. Uh, then of course the other the next so that ability to be able to understand others to me is a spiritual power 
Then the next one, of course, would be something like, uh, well, probably like a salesperson in a way. If we try to understand the other person, it's also important to be able to provide for their needs and to know how to provide, when to provide, or if to provide at all. It's a little bit like a salesman where the customer comes in and in a perfect situation, the customer would not have any wants or desires, but only needs. And in a perfect situation, the salesperson would know how to give them the exact thing that they need to solve their particular problem for the right value, the right price, so to speak. And in other words, to be just, to be fair. And that's not an easy thing to do. Often there are people who uh, will go buy something and they're simply fulfilling their desires. There is somebody who will respond to that desire and give them something that they have simply for their own desires to make money without necessarily telling the other person, well, there's something better down the street or there's something that's both better and cheaper down the street. So it also means learning how to tune in to others as well not just simply uh, of saying what is right, but saying, saying it at the right time and providing to their needs. And this of course comes back to what I was saying earlier, the idea is not to be provocative, but sometimes we can't help it. There's the saying from Jesus where he told his disciples, uh, you know, go out into the world and teach, but remember they will hate you, but at least know they hated me first. And there's a little bit of truth to that, especially if you're discussing philosophy with the people around you. Now, the next thing we have to understand is how to gain the skills necessary for service and to know what skills to acquire, how to attain those skills. This is a, certainly a spiritual power. In a way, if we go to work in the Theosophical Society, it doesn't really matter what skills we have. Obviously, our interest, our skills will help us to find work there in one form or another. And as long as we have an interest in something like Theosophy, and the same thing applies to any nonprofit organization, as long as our interest is there, then we'll find the skills necessary where they're lacking or deficient. Um, but it will only work if we focus ourselves, forget the self, focus on our dharma, learn the skills necessary and throw ourselves into the work and do it to the best of our ability. Every fine detail. It's sometimes said that great filmmakers, for example, are great filmmakers because of their attention to detail, having the smallest little bit of color to have the position of props in the scenes in such a way that it expresses some symbolism related to the picture itself, to the film. And in a way we have to apply ourselves to the work and to gaining the right skills in the same way. Pay attention to the details. The next thing of course is being completely uh, focused and um, completely dedicated to the work because that creates an inner fire and that inner fire then uh, can't help but react on the people around us just as much as we react on the inspiration of those around us as well. And of course, the last thing is to work with a sense of brotherhood. I know that word is probably a little bit lacking in the English language. And uh, unfortunately we don't have anything yet that means quite the same thing that reflects the idea that we all are united as part of if you like the spiritual parentage of the one life and we are the children of that one life and that to me is part of the nature of the idea of brotherhood gender neutral um, spiritually gender inclusive if you like materially but certainly something that involves the whole and in that sense i think that kind of brotherhood where we are all interlinked interrelated is so important to develop because it's impossible to do work without that link 
And just like in a family, people will have their differences, their arguments, but the links will still bring them back together because they feel that there's a responsibility through the tie of blood, but there's a greater responsibility through the tie of the spiritual. And we can either work with that to the best of our ability, no matter how often we fail, or we can walk away from it. And sometimes as hard as that is, it doesn't always help. Sometimes we just have to endure and persevere. Thank you.